Testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Nobody in the waiting room yet, Jeff. That's a good sign. Yeah, but what happened to my video? I can't, it says no video. So are you, having a, are you having a camera problem? Or... I don't know. I hear an echo, too. Uh-oh. I'm going to leave and come back. Yeah.
Can I start with you? Um, sure, yes. Um, Michelle Chase, uh, Town of Agron. And Gary? Um, yeah, Gary Breer, Mass Bike. Great. And uh, Nick? Up, oh, you're muted, Nick. Yeah, Nick Dines from Williamsburg, uh, Mill River Greenway. And Ben? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I started with Mass.District 2 about three weeks ago now, so just sitting in on this to be a sponge and absorb everything. <laughs> uh, welcome. Uh, Alexis? Hi, um, I live in East Hampton, and I'm with Mass Bike with Gary. And thanks, Alexis. Betsy? Unmute. Betsy Johnson, uh, Walk Bike Springfield, and uh, Walk Bo um, Statewide Pedestrian Organization, Walk Boston, which is in the process within the next two months of changing the name. Oh, we'll look forward with great anticipation. To what well, you can guess what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don? Don Nim, City of Holyoke. And uh, Jennifer? Hi, Jen Gannett, Chief of Staff in Agawam. And Van? Van Kukoyanakis with VHB. And Tom, did I get Tom? Uh, good morning. This is Tom Ruda, Mass DOT, uh, District 2 Assistant uh, Projects Engineer, also the Bike Ped Coordinator for the district. Thank you. Thanks so much. Did I miss anybody? Uh, great. Well, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I apologize. The, the agenda that went out had, um, unfortunately, none of you noticed it. <laughs> 8.45 is start time. Uh, we don't start at 8.45, but I... I uh, neglected to change that. So that we're here at the right time. You're here at the right time and you're in the right place. And we're really glad you're here. And we encourage you to stay for JTC after the meeting if, if your time allows. Today's agenda, um, we had basically two uh, areas of focus that we wanted to talk about. You know, we talked earlier that we put in our unified work program a task to create a regional bike network. And um, for those of you that had a chance to go to Moving Together, um, Massachusetts on unveiled, MassDOT unveiled a um, priority network. And I guess it was the trails team. So all of the, the uh, state agencies that cooperate on the trails program. And, um, and so there were elements of that that, is, that are relevant to our work in creating a regional network. So I wanted to look at that just briefly and get some feedback on that would help us as we develop our regional network of trails. And um, and then also we're gonna include the New England Rail Trail Network that the Rails to Trails Conservancy um, has put together recently. And it's got such a, a slightly broader focus than just the state. So I wanted to share that with you as well. <laughs> Did anyone have a chance to go to moving together? I was there. This right. is Betsy. Right. Yeah, I thought that there were a lot of great presentations, and many of them are available online still. If you hadn't seen them, also went to the the state mass trails uh, conference as well. Oh, terrific! I'd love to hear if we have a minute an update on anything you might have learned from the state trails conference. Okay. So um, this this priority network of trails is uh, is is a sort of long range vision for the state. And, and I'm borrowing Kurt's presentation here. So if you've seen it before, I apologize if it's duplicative, but um, it's relevant to us. Um, so they, they looked at existing trails and then they had these criteria. And so I wanted you to take a look at these. It's kind of hard to read this, but it has this 32% of residents of Massachusetts are within a it looks like a quarter mile of a shared use path. So they put that metric out there. You know, how close um, is our population to these facilities that we're proposing? And then it also looked at um, residents of color and what percentage of, of uh, residents of color within that same quarter mile buffer of these shared use paths. 
and then also looked at low income and then low vehicle ownership. So households that don't have access to a car. So it had a real equity slant to it. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, we could pick any metric we wanted to, um, but this just gives you an example of what uh, the trails team had when it was envisioning this network. And these green squiggly things are trails that already exist. These are ones you guys have already built. They're on the ground being used every day. The, uh, <clears throat> and then this is what's envisioned, these yellow, um, wait, I think the, yeah, the yellow ones are the gaps and the state is looking to create a network by filling in these gaps with these yellow sections and, um, and prioritizing uh, funding for projects that, that do accomplish this goal of this envisioned shared network. So you could see it's like, of course, you got a, a concentration in the eastern part, the more populated states. If you looked at that criteria, that would make sense. It's got a, a, a focus in our urban core, both Holyoke, East Hampton, Northampton, and Springfield. Um, and then, um, and also out in the Cape, which, you know, I think has an economic advantage or tourism component as well. And then slim down, this is what they came up with. These, these segments, as uh, the um the priority trails network and the green sections are green just because they're not in massachusetts but they're they're connecting segments and um some of this would look familiar if you had looked at the east coast greenway uh which uses portions of this network to complete its you know coastal um uh route along the east coast and um <clears throat> the uh and then we talk, well, how impactful is this? And I think what what we, uh, another variable that's important to look at where, well, this is where those mass trails grants are going. So, um, and now it's not exclusive. Obviously, if you look at this, there's other trails that are getting funding, um, but the effort is there to prioritize trails that for funding that are on this network. And that's, that has an impact on you and your projects. So, um, and then, um, and then these were construction grants. So you had planning grants and then construction grants. The, um, of course, the bulk of money that goes towards constructing trails does not come out of the mass trails program. Um, in many ways, you can think of the mass trails program as seed money to make these projects happen. Um, because for our municipalities, it's a huge struggle to come up with design money um, and planning funds to, to develop a project. And it takes a really long time. As you all know, many of you are in that boat right now. And um, so uh, Mass Trails Program has always been a great resource for securing design and, and uh, even some acquisition funds. The, um, <clears throat> And this map pretty much shows that. But then beyond that, the construction funds um, often come through our tip and uh, in various forms. Um, now, this map on the lower end here with all the green and blue and yellow, this is looking at the statewide inventory of on-road trail projects as well as off-road. So on-road facilities like bike lanes, separated bike lanes, buffered bike lanes. All those projects um, are still a priority as they would be for our region. Um, the priority trails network though is just those, those pink trails that are in the top. And then to go back to um, what we mentioned briefly that the construction funds are largely coming off our tips. Um, these were the list that, that were presented um, at, that, at the um, mass trails, I mean, at the Moving Together conference, as these are the big box. So this is where the money's going to fund construction. Um, so you can look down that list and uh, you may notice <laughs> notice something, but, um, you know. Uh, Nothing out here. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's, again, go back to the criteria, you know, they have that focus. And um, we certainly have the ability to prioritize um, projects on our tip as well. 
And I think you have in the past. You've put, for instance, the Westfield um, uh, um, uh, levee uh, trail system was something that you had prioritized on your tip. That'd be a great example where, you know, that project could be on this list. Um, but were, were there any questions about um, the priority trails network and that equity focus? Does anything jump out or do you have any questions about this? Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, so who's the group that's putting together this priority? But who's, yeah, who's vetting like these projects? So this is the Mass Trails team. Okay. So, and the Mass Trails team is is a conglomerate of a DCR, yeah. Mass DOT, and EEA. So um, so those organizations all have trail planning components and funding uh, that they have access to. Um, you know, even things like Gateway Cities program funding comes through some of these, uh, you know, some of these uh, agencies. So there's money to implement projects. And they also have statewide you know, targets and, and um, CMAC funds that um, there's more flexing in those funds that, and of course these projects are eligible for that funding. So by pooling those agency resources uh, together, they really created what is the, you know, the trails program in Massachusetts, uh, one that was certainly nowhere near as robust as what we have today. Um, at the same time, it, it, you know, the, the programs in the past were often regionally based. So you all had um, on your JTC had transportation enhancement money, if you remember that program, mm -hmm. and you funded the design through your tip for the Connecticut Riverwalks and Agawam and Springfield, the um, Manhattan Rail Trails, the um, Springfield projects, all those were, were getting funding through your tip. Um, and so you were making decisions about what would be a priority network. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is just, uh, you know, I think this is just the natural evolution of things when that decision-making process, you know, moves elsewhere. Well, and those three representatives from those three agencies meet every two weeks, all year round. I mean, they're, they have, um, I mean, it's a planning committee that, that uh, you know, uh, among the agencies that meets that uh, meets regularly, which was the big, the big change. Yeah, and there's also a citizens based component to that trails yeah. team, uh, and uh, so there, and that has like snowmobilers on it and other uh, um, interested parties and stakeholders. Uh, so there is that as well. So Jeff. Um... You know, I mean, I think you know the the project I'm I'm been trying to push for for a while is the uh, the Springfield Water and Sewer um, corridor that runs through Aguam all the way between um, from the South End Bridge to Provo mm -hmm. Mountain, basically. And then, um, and I know uh, at the time, Crisati was interested in trying to get in on that if we could get access to that corridor. Um, basically putting in a, a multi-use trail from the South End Bridge, the Riverwalk, to the Farmington Canal Trail. Um, and, but Springfield Water and Sewer does not want to provide access to this. I'm wondering if this group might be able to help push um, Springfield Water and Sewer to allow um, that access. Um, and I know, uh, was it the DPW superintendent for um, for Springfield? He was at Moving Together, and he talked about how he's you know proactive about um, you know complete streets and all that stuff. So I don't know if there's any way we could get all these people in in one room and and or on a conference call and talk about potentially trying to get that. Yeah, um, I think that would be a. We'd I think sure that like would be to help. Idea. We'd sure like to help with as much as we could. I yeah. mean, we have the the hang up. Despite all this coming together of these three agencies, DEP is totally holding up and has in its hands the fate of the McKnight Rail Trail. And 
they've held it up now for it's been held up now coming on a year and so we're about to lose the mass trails money because they won't real uh they won't issue their ruling related to the degree of wetland um and and the level of um remediation that has to be done for you know or excess design that has to be done because of the trail being in quote a wetland yeah so, that's... You've got, so you've got you know on one hand they're saying oh we're doing all these things to push all this thing forward and then behind the scenes they're totally deep sixing it so we're we don't know what to do anymore yeah that is very frustrating and at the same time you're moving ahead with uh east springfield east... six yeah i mean the irony is that's going to get done before the part that's you know been over 20 years in the push you know the whole thing has been over 20 years but you don't know well and the good news we... is it's on this map so yeah <laughs> I mean, everything I see out in, you know, the eastern part of the state, Boston, Sudbury, Southboro, um, you know, you have all these aqueducts that are open to the public for walking, biking, whatever, you know, and then you get to Springfield and they fence it off. And it just seems like we're missing out on a really nice connection, you know, between the river walk and, and a path that's going to connect Northampton to New Haven, you know. So I think it's a I think it's a, a key connection that would be um we'd be crazy to try not to get more people to to push for that if we can. I don't know. I know Spring One stores their own entity, but uh, so yeah. Jeff, could Pioneer Valley sort of planning commission sort of be the independent party who's because they're probably not even aware, really that aware of the desire for this project could well, you be the convener they were of this about 10 years ago yeah but yeah now yeah. and i bet kurt gardner there doesn't know about it yeah no no i'd be very surprised I mean, if could they knew the, could the you know the planning commission sort of be the sort of third party convener to help? absolutely i think yeah. we could and you know there's to michelle's credit there's very shoot few east west corridors in our region you know we're a valley mm -hmm. everything runs north south and any east west corridors are just so rare um you know usually we have to go across a river um so uh i can see a real value of making that connection um across there has michelle has there ever been a feasibility study done for that um corridor we have we have a draft kind of set of plans that you know were made on um you know, based on so Springfield Water and Sewer came through what, like six years ago, maybe, and replaced all their transmission lines. And so we just superimposed uh, a shady's path on top of that and kind of, you know, came up with uh, a rough draft um, plan showing where all the crossings were. And, you know, uh, they already have bridges and stuff where all the streams are because they drive over it, over the, the, uh, the easement. Um, and there are there are precedents for this. The uh, I was involved with the creation of a shared use path that runs through the um, Mansfields, no Mar Marshfields. I don't know any one of one of those M places down on the South Shore. Um, sewer line goes through Norton, and they put a, a shared use path on top of it. I mean, yes, there has to be you know full well, just like the Riverwalk. There's constant need for being having to give access to you know construction work and stuff but yet yet meanwhile there's still the path i can send jeff i can send you a, a copy of the plans that we have i'd love to see those yeah okay. i think it, at the very least we could convene a a, a meeting to, for some discussion about it maybe there's issues that we're not aware of um you know and, and as you mentioned it's been a while since yeah so that we'd be happy to do that okay yeah hey jeff if i can just chime in um here a minute 
Um, you know, I think all of us look at these maps and go, hey, wait a minute, why did you choose this as opposed to that? And, and uh, uh, even I'm doing that as I look at this hatched line uh, up through Franklin County. Um, but at the same time, I'm just really pleased to see this kind of a map that, you know, all of us who have been fighting for different projects for 20 or 30 years, it's really useful to see how our priorities being uh, being made and it, it kind of creates a context to be able to bring all of our expertise and each of those um, uh, desires to the table and you know have Kurt out here or have uh, you know in, engage around this tool um, as opposed to what is often a very frustrating process for us as as uh, favored projects uh, just seem to languish. So um, while I certainly have ideas about how I'd, I'd like to see this network uh, uh, changed, um, it, it's really nice to have a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a plan in place and a target in place that allows for that discourse. So thanks so much for sharing this. Yeah, and I, I hope I didn't put too negative a slant on it. I think it's wonderful as well. I think to see this happening in Massachusetts is just phenomenal. Um, you know, a rising boat, you know, rising tide raises all boats scenario. I mean, yeah. a lot of what's holding back projects in in our region isn't the state or funding, it's it's our local community. So uh and their priorities. Uh and you know, and Betsy talks about the challenges in Springfield. So it, it's it's not a you know finger pointing exercise here. Um this map has existed for years and they've never shared it because of just this, this discussion or concerns that we have. So I think it's bold that they put it out. It's envisionary. It's like something to get excited about. Um, so, yeah. Good, thanks. Um, very valuable. So with that, I'm, and again, we're just thinking about this in the context of we've got to do our own regional network. So, um, something to think about it's always going to be hard uh it's, there's no easy thing it's like trying to decide which of your kids are going to keep something like that the, although i i don't have so much trouble doing that but um the uh the other thing is uh the new england rail trail network so i wanted to bring this one up it's a little larger context and um so here you can see look we made it on on the map uh which is wonderful so it picks up the New Haven Northampton Canal Line corridor, um, all the way from, you know, down New Haven straight up, you know, including the Farmington, and then into Massachusetts, and then Mass Central all the way across. Um, when they were working on this, uh, they met with all the states, different constituents, and they wanted something that was a bold vision, something that people could get excited about, um, that would help projects that were struggling that needed support and at the same time projects that had a high likelihood of being successful and uh, with support and and so it wasn't anything crazy it was designed to be a this this idea that um together uh we're stronger than when we're separate and how can we build uh you know these partnerships to foster the development of of the trails that we all hold so dear and so um so this one had a, did not have an equity slant as we looked in the other uh example this one was looking for uh, uh being impactful in other words in, um, implementing change or bringing resources where they they're needed and um and i have to say it's been um they've had this now for over a year it's been effective there have been a number of grants associated with it and they're more on the way um, that involve all of these uh, state partners. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, there's so much that you can learn when you're working with someone who's already tackled a certain project or is about to. And so there's a lot of constituent building with, with this network. Um, and that's something that we could also um, explore as we're putting our network together. Well, that was also the concept behind the creation of the East Coast Greenway 20 something years ago was to really just sort of put out a bold vision that would help to sort of 
push along possible projects and um, really, and, you know, people did, they did exploratory rides and, you know, and the idea that there could be more or less a, a 80% off-road um, shared use path route from Maine to Florida. And it, you know, really has, you know, made a difference in some places. Yeah, and I noticed they gave up, East Coast Greenway gave a presentation at Moving Together. I, I did not have a chance to uh, sit in on that one. Um, you can see on this map, following the light green line is the East Coast Greenway as it tracks through our region. It does shift, it does move. It's moved a number of times. Um, and there are there are or have been spurs that go out to the Cape and come across on a ferry. There's been some crazy things that have happened with it. Of course, I'm always very partial to the fact that I'm like, I need to go up through Massachusetts and across the Mass Central. <laughs> but, but again, um, you know, they're trying to capture all the states and and uh, Rhode Island. There's something to be said for that state. The, um, oh, Betsy, you're you're muted. Of 20 years ago, Rhode Island was the one state that actually had trails. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we you connect to and utilize um Rhode Island's trails uh, and Connecticut's trails. So that's why it ends up taking that kind of route because those trails already existed way ahead of a number of ours. Yeah. And in East Coast should be close to the East Coast as well. So the um yeah. And any questions on uh the New England Rail Trail network? That, and this is largely, uh, you know, was all the states are involved, but it was coordinated by the Rails to Trails Conservancies and uh, their Northeast Regional Director, Tom Sexton, who's up here routinely. And many of you may have met Tom. Uh, the, uh, well, I, I'd like to just comment that uh, one of the values of a, a comprehensive uh, map, a visionary map like this, is that it sets a context for smaller communities like ours, Williamsburg, uh, we've always argued that um, uh, it's important to be able to have connectivity to, uh, us, to a number of population groups. And so we've always argued that the value of having a local trail uh, connecting to the Mass Central or uh, you know the New Haven uh, is a logical planning concept and it, it allows uh, resources then to be uh, allocated because that's in fact uh, what the uh, the larger objective is is to have the connectivity so having the vision plan uh is an important um tool uh, uh besides a graphic it's actually a substantive way of making an argument for uh financial and planning support well that's really helpful to have that feedback i think we can take that into our network planning efforts and and make sure that whatever we create is exciting and engaging to our to our communities in some way. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. And um, just under uh, other other business, part of that uh, Mass Trails conference, I mean, this it was the Moving Together conference was um, uh, an update on an inventory that MassDOT has been doing on the, the trails networks across the state. And um, as part of that effort, they've been uploading Google Street View data. Um, so if in the past you've been really frustrated that when you're planning out your trips, you couldn't on Google Maps, you couldn't go to Street View and see your trails like you can for roads, uh, that feature is being added through this effort. And in fact, uh, I know at a meeting I was just at recently, they were interested in doing more of this and in fact, uh, um, enabling communities uh, and advocacy groups to collect this data with the equipment that they have right now. So it's, it's just a matter of hooking it up and going for a ride. Um, I think there's a- well, how, do you, how do you volunteer to do that? Uh, I'll find out and let you know. Okay, because yeah. I know that's been one of our things about the Riverwalk. We, yeah. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, that Deb Huber has brought that up so many times that 
Uh, yeah, she'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it, the camera's pretty wild. Well, you've probably all seen the Street View camera driving around at, at one point or another, and um, in your communities. But yeah, it's a great a great feature, and why not have the trails on there? Um, especially because at the pace we move, all this information is very relevant. You know, uh, when you're planning your journey. But is anyone else interested in um, logging the trail data for Street View? If there's if there's a uh, capacity to do so. And then um, the uh, the other item I just wanted to bring up was a, a recent um, the uh, a recent um, uh, notification just went out uh, yesterday, I think it was on um, speed feedback signs for school zones and mass dot is rolling out through the sh the um the safe Roots school program um a funding opportunity where you can the municipalities can obtain the resources to install uh speed feedback signs around school zones and um it's just a it's almost like an extension of the shared streets and spaces program where they just basically send you the money. It couldn't be any easier, um, but those applications are due. Um, Michelle, do you remember when they're due? I think it's like, it's in January. January 16th, I think. The 15th? 16th. 16th, okay. Um, so I know that's like, that's a quick turnaround. Uh, but the state has recognized that, you know, speeding and fatality, pedestrian fatalities is, is a big issue in Massachusetts. And it's a challenge for us uh, to be dealing with this problem. And they wanted to throw all the resources they could uh, to help with this problem. So it's a great opportunity um, if you have identified a need or have the capacity to identify a need around your schools. Do you know um, how much, what's the max grant? Your funding range? Yeah, I should know that. I just read okay. it yesterday. We'll look. Okay, yeah. that's right. I'll send, we'll that. send it around to everybody. Okay. And um, yeah, and then it is, you know, again, that program has been uh, made the funding very accessible. Uh, so, and broken down a lot of the usual headaches that go along with obtaining uh, funding. Um, so we're thrilled with that. And then the... Uh, I have a few folks here that I'd love to get an update from if we have a minute. I know that the JTC starts, I think they moved it to 10, uh, but I haven't heard anything on um, the uh, Williamsburg uh, Haydenville Mill River Greenway project in a while. And uh, if Nick, if you have any updates that you could share, I know we'd appreciate those. Uh, yes. Uh, and um we benefited by some a uh, lot of good friends. Um, one of us, one of them was um, uh, Adam Hines, Senator Adam Hines, who uh, left uh, the Senate and is now uh, director of the Ted Kennedy. Uh, uh, I, I, it's an institute, a government institute, and uh, he, in 2020 he secured a he uh, advanced a. A bond bill, transportation bond bill, and that's one of those earmarks. And we benefited by shaking the tree this year, and uh, we got it released uh, to um, District One. So it's uh, it's it allows us to construct um, the South Main Street uh, section of the Mill River Greenway, and VHB is now they've done the engineering, and we're submitting it uh, scope and and. Um, uh, scope and cost documents to them, uh, and it's an exciting um, development. But it's one of those things where uh, small communities need to to uh, figure out uh, different ways. I mean, uh, of doing this, and uh, and uh, so we took we took a, a Don Quixote approach, and uh, it worked. So we actually jousted with the windmills and. Uh, we won <laughs> well that is just phenomenal i can't believe it you know uh we the bond program how many times you know our our thoughtful legislators will put uh our projects in the bond bill with 
all these millions of dollars and then there's no spending authority and the towns call us up and say we got the money and it's on the bond bill and we're always like we don't want to say anything because it's like uh but good luck so you have definitely you need to teach uh, one of those master classes on how did you get bond bill money um freed up so congratulations nick that is you definitely won that battle that's um, cool <laughs> So uh, anyway, it's it's a uh, one of those serendipity moments, but also it's uh, strategically it's um, it's every source you can possibly think. Of. And also that map that you showed, um, uh, Williamsburg has benefited a great deal um, by that uh, priority um, trail system because uh, with regard to mass trails, and so. Um, uh, this is a, a tangible evidence of um, the effectiveness of uh, that that priority system. So we we um, are very grateful, hum humbled and grateful at the same time. Yeah, no, that's that's great that you 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 picked up picked up a good point that being part of that network and we've actually seen that happen with Southampton as well. Could yeah. not get money for Southampton. Once we convinced them that it was part of this priority network, that it was doable, um, you know, again, not we didn't, it's not our doing, it's like they all of a sudden the funding started to flow. Uh, so it, it does help to be a part of, of a priority network. So, and, um, and uh, I don't know if anyone has any updates in Westfield. I know they've been painting the bridge that goes over, I think it's Elm Street, and uh. I was out there recently and they were making great progress. And I think, I, I don't know how cold it can get before you have to stop painting, but um, uh, Tom, have you heard anything on that project at all? I'm sorry, no, I have not. Um, when it's in construction, it's in construction and uh, they manage that. Um, but yes, there there is a temperature limitation on when they can actually paint that bridge. Okay. So I, I don't have any uh, I don't have any data on it right now. No. I drove by it last week. It was already painted. It's beautiful. It Are was... the tarps Alexa saw the tarps off of it? Like... Yeah, they were building the decking. Oh wow. This was oh, Thursday. That's a... Yeah. That's... I went down um like three months ago and got a walking tour um with with um jonathan i'm forgetting his last name right now and he showed us all the progress so when i drove under it i was like they painted it <laughs> yeah the tarps are gone it's bright bright black shiny oh, right they didn't pick blue you know I, that there was the sunderland bridge that was i think blue the uh all right millbury has a purple one so uh I'm, that's exciting they should have picked brown. I'm always a, a, a favorite of uh, Eiffel Tower brown. Next one, we'll put that on the list. And then Valley Bike, um, and I apologize, don't have an update on Valley Bike. Betsy, do you know, uh, I know there was some staffing changes there at Valley ba Bike. I think well, Sh um, Shannon has left and that their reason for clo closing it down this winter is they have a staff shortage. Um, although some of the stations still have their bikes at them, um, I think what's just not happening is if a station ends up with no bikes, there's no staff moving bicycles around. Um, and I don't know the exact status, but I know it's probably it's, it's slated to happen in 2023 that they're going to and have additional stations in Indian Orchard um, section of Springfield. Um, that would enable people to readily go from Indian Orchard to Ludlow and um, around, you know, that whole, in that whole area. So, um, but that's all, uh, that's all I know. You know, I don't, I know Shannon hasn't been replaced yet. Okay. Well, thanks for that update. Betsy, can I ask a question? So we were just discussing this in our bike ped, our city bike ped um, group here, and it wasn't, definite that they were closing for the winter. We have some concern here for people who are using it for their primary, you know, transportation during the winter. Has it been decided, do you know, that they- I, re I received an email saying, you know, a black, you know, sort of a blast email to people who were 
you know, in the get their thing, that it was closing for the winter because of staff shortages. But as I said, then I've seen stations that still have bicycles. Okay. But it does look like what it, that's meaning is they're not necessarily removing bicycles. They're just not. If it, Then I've seen stations with no bicycles. So I think it just means they're not, they don't have the staff to. Okay. I don't really know what it totally means is what is okay. my answer. Well, at least so there, there seems to be a reason, so you know, staff shortages I get, just wanting that to be the, the precedent, you know, isn't exactly. so great. But maybe it's yeah. just, you know, we're all dealing with shortages. I, I can understand that. So Yeah, thank no, you. but it would be worth trying to contact them and say, particularly if you know of stations that people are, you know, are really dependent on telling them, yeah, it doesn't look like you're removing all the bicycles. Can you please, you know, keep these at, you know. ABC, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I would, I'd say it'd be worth contacting. Great. Thanks, Betsy. Because I've sort of, as I said, I got this email and then I've been confused because then I've seen these stations that are, the bicycles are all there and seen people taking them, you know. Great. Thanks. Great. And um, I know Gary joined us, but I don't want to put him on the spot. Um, he, he might have some idea on that. Um, the uh, We are going to. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm not sure. what I, I didn't catch the whole conversation. So um, if you have the, a specific question, let me know. Yeah. Bike share. Well, they were wondering the status of bike share for the winter. And there's some staffing issues. I know they were. we were talking about they were working through those. <clears throat> but do you know if they're running bike share through the winter? They are not. <clears throat> Okay. Thanks, Gary. All right. With that, I'm going to thank everyone that took the time to join us today. Your feedback has been really helpful as we launch into this next task of creating a regional network for, for our bikes. And um, I encourage you to join uh, JTC following this meeting. Um, your input is, is always valuable. Link? Can we just stay on? You or can do just we, stay like, here. Or like the last time we had to go to a different link. No, you should be good. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. We do have a quorum and we have 10 o'clock. So whenever you would like to start. Okay, let's call the roll. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right, Agawam. Oh. oh, did you have something to say, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I, I probably should have just referred to the splash screen you had up earlier that we are being recorded if anyone else wants to record. Please just let us know. And um, we are meeting virtually per statutory authority. Okay. Now let's do the roll. Thank you. All right, Agawam. Michelle Chase, 10 Agawam. Amherst. Barnes Airport. Belchertown. Blamford. Brimfield. Chester. Chesterfield. Chicopee. Here, good morning. Good morning. Cummington. 
Oops, one second, sorry. Uh, East Long Meadow, Goshen, Granby, Granville, Hadley, Bill Dwyer, Hamden, Hatfield, Holland, Holyoke. Don Nims here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Huntington, Long Meadow. Ed Keen, Long Meadow. Uh, Ludlow, uh, Mass Bike. Gary, is, uh, here. Yeah, Gary, thank you. And Alexis, is Alexis still on? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, District One, uh, District Two. Good morning, this is Daryl. Ben Breg ben Benjamin Breger is here with yeah. me as well. Good morning. Uh, Middlefield, uh, Carmen from Stavros. Yeah, here. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, Munson. Here. Montgomery. Northampton. Palmer. Pelham. Uh, pedestrian Rep Betsy. Here. Peter Pan. Pioneer Valley Railroad. Uh, PVTA. Plainfield. Russell. South Hadley, Southampton, Southwick, Springfield, Tolland, UMass, uh, Wales, Ware, EDC, Westfield, West Hampton, West Springfield. Yep, Rob Colson. Thank you, Rob. Wilbraham, Williamsburg. Nick Dines. Thank you. And Worthington. Yes, Charlie Rose. And uh, District 1, Peter, you just came in. Dan Murphy's here from East Hampton, too. Oh, sorry, Dan. And then I believe we have, uh, let me just scroll through here quickly. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have Van on the line. Hello. And we have Steve Severia on the line. And am I missing anyone else? Anyone else? I think we got everybody, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Then let's move on to uh, first item. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 9 JTC meeting? So moved. Oh, and a second. Second. Okay. Any corrections, comments, additions to the minutes? Uh, seeing none, uh, could we take a vote on that, Andy? Yep. Agawam? Yes. Chicopee? Yes. East Hampton? Yes. Hadley? Yes. Holyoke? Yes. Longmeadow? Yes. Uh, Gary Massbike? Yes. Uh, District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. Uh, Carmen Stavros? Yes. Okay. Uh, Munson? Yep. Uh, Betsy, P uh, pedestrian rep? Yes. West Springfield? Yes. Williamsburg. I have to abstain. This is Nick. Uh, I wasn't present. Okay. And Worthington. Also abstain. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, oh, minutes are approved. Um, I'll just make a editorial comment about my interpretation of Robert's rules of order. Uh, technically, we should be asking for a motion and a second to even take up an agenda article, mm -hmm. but um, because these sometimes require some background and we're not as up to speed on it as staff, um, what I'm going to do is uh, ask Andy to give a 
summary of what's up and what approval he's looking for. And then I'll call for a motion after we've talked about it for a little bit. So Andy. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we're looking for today from the JTC is a recommendation uh, to approve the transportation evaluation uh, that's currently out for public review and comment. Uh, the JTC, uh, this has been, been presented to the JTC in the past. And at our last meeting, um, JTC ma made a recommendation that the MPO should in fact release the document for public review. Now it's been out, we're gonna summarize the comments um, and then look for that recommendation to the MPO to approve the document. And so I believe the last time we took this up, there were several comments from the JTC. And um, do you uh, want to lay out what kind of comments, feedback we got? Yeah, so um, so the big things, I'm gonna jump ahead a couple slides here. Um, so comments, if you look here at the bottom, um, I'm, I'm included what the MPO was concerned with as well. Um, so one of the big comments brought up by both the JTC and the MPO uh, was the concern with the urban versus rural. And we have uh, you know, agreed that um, rural projects do not score as well as urban projects. And really a big part of that is because of the focus of the money and the way that the, the TEC has to be structured uh, based on these state and federal requirements. It's just, you know, a fact that a rural project's never gonna score as good as an urban project. What we can do is make the, the TEC more flexible. Um, so, um, you know, certain uh, parts of projects in rural areas, we, we can ensure that they do, uh, you know, get acknowledged and they do get some scoring. Um, so we feel that the, the, agenda, the uh, proposed changes uh, actually will uh, Im have a positive impact on the scoring of those rural projects. Um, and again, we'll go through that um, in a moment. Uh, secondly, uh, there was uh, a question from the MPO regarding uh, rural ac access to employment and how that is uh, reflected in the TEC. Um, and at the time, we, you know, I didn't have necessarily a good answer, but the best answer we can provide is is the the function or the uh, the roadway functional classification that takes into consideration uh, the the road and how it is used by uh, you know residents uh, in, in those rural areas and how those uh, roads uh, provide that access. So by a, a a project being eligible on a rural road. Uh, is because that road is being identified as a critical link to to uh, employment. Uh, and then the the other uh, significant comment that was, um, or not significant comment, but other other comment of note um, was with one of the the definitions um, um, within the TEC uh, District Two commented that uh, they felt it might be more uh, appropriate to. Um, have the uh, criterion as um, improves connections between housing and and service facilities or retail establishments. Uh, PVPC's recommendation is um, connections between housing and employment. We feel that by listing employment, it does actually still include uh, facility and retail establishments. Um, so those are the the, the major comments that uh, we have noted. Um, and then I have some findings, uh, Mr. Chairman. I do have a couple charts that I, I, I have done to show how the impact, the uh, proposed changes impact different types of projects. Would you like me to go over that before or after the recommendation? Why don't we go over that now and then okay. we'll call for a motion. Sure, great. And then we can discuss right. it. Uh, so what we did was we took three projects that are currently programmed. Uh, in the TIP, um, I, none of these projects are in the first year of the TIP, but they all have designs that are at least at 25% design. Uh, so we do know quite a bit about the projects. I will say, and I'll go over this again when I get to that last slide, that obviously we don't know 
the nuts and bolts of these projects. I did send a couple emails with some clarifications on, on some project information. Uh, but one thing to know is come January, when we start looking at these, these projects, we do anticipate there'll be some change in the cost. Uh, but going on the information we have available to us today, uh, this is a chart uh, for the Chesterfield project, which is currently programmed in and out here at a tip. The blue uh, graph lines are um, the proposed or what the scoring would look under the proposed amendment to the TEC. And the orange line is the current uh, project scoring uh, under the current TEC. And so what I want to bring to your attention is um, livability. Uh, you can see that uh, under this, the Chesterfield project would in fact experience a minor increase in score under livability. Uh, this is based on uh, changing of the language. Uh, so Chesterfield is not currently a complete streets approved municipality. However, by changing the language uh, to read if the project does include complete streets elements uh, consistent with the MassDOT policy, they are eligible for partial points. So they're not getting the full points for this um, because to get the full points, you need to have the project listed in your, your complete streets um, plan. Um, jumping ahead <clears throat> to South Hadley, again, programmed in the out year of the tip. Um, actually, let me jump back for one second. So South, uh, the, the Chesterfield project would experience a one point increase for total score. Um, the South Hadley project, would actually experience a short-term decrease in score uh, based on the mobility criterion. Um, but what we did here uh, was uh, we're prioritizing, if you recall, uh, under system preservation, we're prioritizing uh, if the project is listed in the congestion management process. What we're doing here, again, as a reminder, is making the 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 TEC um, more precise and more uh, more consistent with current state and federal guidelines. Um, so this project would actually experience a short-term uh, decrease under livability and under safety and security. Again, I'm saying short-term because we still feel as these projects move through the process and as we review them with the municipality and their consultants, um, they may not get points under these specific criterion, but uh, some of the additional criterion that we've added to be more consistent with state and federal guidelines uh, are available and we believe they will um, receive at least partial points on those. Um, and then the third project we looked at was the, the Springfield X project. Um, and this also experienced a short-term decrease of two points, um, which you'll see here is, um, under system preservation, uh, they're experiencing a two point increase and under mobility, they're experiencing a two point decrease. And this is again, to put more of an emphasis on the congestion ma management process, which is a federal requirement and less of an emphasis on, uh, congestion, on uh, the mobility congestion element. Uh, so really the points just swap there. On the livability side, again, we had taken a point that we're using later in the criterion um on that quite on that uh section uh as well as under safety and security again you saw that on the south hadley project as well we, we were moving a point away from there uh under environment and climate change you see they did experience a slight increase and under quality of life they did uh experience a slight increase um, and again, I'm going to jump back once more here again this is a summary that went out of the proposed changes um, I should have probably showed this first, actually. My apologies for doing this backwards. Um, and so in summary, uh, we feel that uh, these changes are making um, the scoring more uh, concise with current federal and state uh, standards. Uh, we also wanted to remove some of the, the redundancies, and we feel like we have done that. Um, and again, this is just an estimate as of today, and we, we do acknowledge the fact that these scorings are going to change um, come January when we review, uh, or actually I should say February, when we review all projects with the uh, municipalities. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, 
I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thank you. So at this point, uh, let me ask for a motion to uh, recommend uh, the criteria to the MPO for endorsement. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments about where we are with this at this point? If you want to just raise your hand, I'll, I think that pops you to the top of the list and I'll get a chance. I'll uh, toss in one. I, I'm just a, a little uncertain about the, um, the District 2 comment and what the objective was there. And maybe uh, District 2 could speak to it because it does seem that we move between our housing and our employment and our gas stations and our grocery stores. So it seems like all three work together in there. Is there a rationale for recommending the change language? Yeah, this, uh, this is Daryl again. So this was comment was made a while, quite a while ago. And uh, to be honest with you, I think maybe um, I said, a, a, you know, a service facility or retail establishment to kind of identify more of a, a destination, I think. Um, but I mean, I, you know, between housing and employment, that's fine with me as well. You know, I just, I just thought that it, um, kind of clarified more of a destination because, well, you know, service facility or retail establishment will cover as well. Um, but, but no, that, that makes sense between housing and employment. You're right. If you uh, have apartment, apartment, apartment complexes, is, is, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Is there any reason not to have all three? Um, they're all destinations, right? Uh, no, I mean, we could just list, like, we could list all three. Housing and employment facilities, service facilities, and retail establishments. Yeah, it just helps clarify it. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none, I'll uh, call for a vote on the motion. Andy? Okay, uh, Agawam? Yes. Chickabee? Yes. East Hampton? Yes. Hadley? Yes. Holyoke. Yes. Longmeadow. Yes. Mass Bike. Yes. Gary. District one. Yes. District two. Yes. Uh, Carmen Stavros. Yes. Munson. Yes. Uh, pedestrian Rep Betsy. Yes. West Springfield. Yes. Williamsburg. Yes. And Worthington. Yes. Okay, Mr. Chairman. And a PVTA has joined us. Oh, I'm sorry. I, we have a PVTA on the line as well. Uh, Paul, do you want to vote or do you want to abstain on this? Sorry, for some reason, couldn't unmute. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman. All right, I would declare that the motion has passed and let's move on to the Title VII update. And again, why don't uh, Jeff give us a summary of this, and then we'll go on to craft a motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Andy, is my screen visible? Yes, you're all set, Jeffrey. Thanks so much. So as a recipient of federal funds, the Pioneer Valley MPO has a responsibility to have a comprehensive Title VI program. The Title VI program ensures that we don't uh, deny access or resources to uh, based on race, color, national origin. And uh, every year we update this program. This year is a more comprehensive update. And um, the major elements of this year's program are outlined here. So there's requirements from both Federal Highway as well as Federal Transit, our federal partners. And uh, so this year we're you know, you've seen the recent update to the public participation plan, but um, we're also looking at other aspects of our Title VI program and have been updating those as well. And um, we uh, 
you might ask, well, what's different this year than past years? Well, when we looked at income for our region, uh, this this body has defined what low income populations, how the definition for low income populations by block group level and new census data just came out last week. And when we uh, took a look at that data, we added some block groups and we also uh, removed some from our low income classifications. So those in green were previously on this slide um, part of a low end definition, low income definition, and now they are not. And then a few we added, most notably um, Huntington out in the Hilltowns. So um, the this is interesting. So we take our um, project layer, so all the TIP projects and and look at how funds are distributed based on low income and minority populations to assure that that resources are being uh, allocated for the entire population and and equitably. And then to simplify things, we did create an all new Title VI web page where all this information can be found. So it's much easier to look at than when it was just a document that you had to download. So all the different components are at the new website. And uh, this is very much a living, breathing program. As I mentioned, we update it every year. And so we're thrilled to have a home for it all where you can easily find this information uh, when you need it. And it's important to note that when you work with state and federal programs, their definitions for low income and minority will be different than ours. I know in the past we've had communities that have applied for federal grants or state grants under the premise that they were low income and they only to find out they didn't meet state or federal criteria. So do be careful about how you use the data. Um, and we'll be looking at this a lot uh, in greater detail next year as we go through the RTP. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. So uh, is there a motion to <clears throat> recommend to the Metropolitan Planning Organization the release of this report for public review? So moved. And a second? Second. And any questions, comments to item five? Raise your hand if you have something to say. Seeing none, I will we'll call for a vote. Andy? Agawam? Yes. Chickabee? Yes. East Hampton? Yes. Hadley? Yes. Holyoke? Yes. Longmeadow? Yes. Uh, Mass Bike, Gary? Yes. District 1? Yes. District two? Yes. Carmen Stavros? Yes. Munson? Yes. Uh, pedestrian Rep Betsy? Yes. Uh, PVTA? Yes. West Springfield? Yes. Williamsburg? Yes. Worthington? Yes. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it appears that the motion carries. Let's move on to number, number five. Well, that looks like Andy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, review a uh, proposed TIP amendment. What we'll be looking for is a recommendation from the JTC that the MPO release this proposed amendment for the required 21 day review and comment period. Um, so, what I'm going to do first as a refresher. Actually, I'm going to handle it this way. Uh, so the, the major changes are actually on the transit side of the tip. Um, we've had uh, what I'll call placeholders in the tip uh, on the transit side in year one. Um, there's two line items um, that PBTA applied for grants for, specifically 5339 uh, funding. Um, uh, the funding was um, announced um, maybe two or three months ago, but at the time of tip development, we didn't know the actual values that PBTA were going to were going to get. We knew what they wanted or needed, we didn't actually know the values. So the first change here uh, is actually two parts. Um, you'll see under the project description portion here. Oops, sorry about that. You see under the project uh, description here, 
Uh, the original proposed project had Northampton maintenance facility listed. Uh, it's in fact the UMass transit maintenance uh, building um, that should have been listed. So that's the first part of this amendment. The second part is increasing the funding uh, from 3.6 million to 11.8 million. You'll see the, the breakout. Uh, this is the federal portion, the 2.8. Uh, we're asking for that to be increased to the actual awarded amount of 9.44. Uh, and then the, the state uh, RTA cap is being increased from uh, 720,000 to $2.36 million. Uh, again, this is the award amount. Uh, the total award amount is 11.8 million. Uh, the second part of this amendment, uh, again, another 5339, this is called a low no grant. So basically under this grant, you're buying infrastructure to reduce uh, your emissions basically. So it's going from diesel buses to hybrid or full electric buses. And it also supports um, equipment and upgrades at your maintenance facilities to support that infra infrastructure. So when we had developed the 23 tip, we had a line item of uh, $32 million uh, when in fact the approved uh, award is $55.7 million. So again, you'll see here, we just had this general line item and now here's the actual uh, money. So the money uh, consists of uh, 44.56 million in federal money and 11.14 million in uh, state matching money. And this is to purchase new buses, new chargers, and to uh, install electric and solar equipment uh, to support the charging of the buses. Um, so that's the first part of this amendment. And I'd like to ask uh, Paul at PBTA if I missed anything or if he has anything to add to this part. It sounds as if you've gotten all of it. I, I, okay. I don't, nothing jumps out at me as missing. Okay. And then, uh, so the second part of this amendment that we're, we're looking for the JTC to propose to the MPO is increasing uh, funding. This is a statewide item. This is not part of our regional target funds. This is the additional money outside that uh, that that target money that the state has allocated to our region for uh, an intersection improvement uh, in Springfield at St. James Ave, St. James Boulevard and Carew Street. Uh, again, the, the approved value on the tip was this 6.766702 million. And the, uh, the new value is this 9086046 uh, as a result of cost increases. Um, so again, Mr. Chairman, we're looking for a recommendation from the JTC to the MPO to release this document for the 21 day public review period. Okay, so is there a motion to that effect to release the document to recommend the document be released for review? So moved. And is there a second? Second. And are there any questions or comments? Well, I'll, I'll throw in one uh, question. Uh, am I understanding this is all new money that's come in and it's not uh, not slicing up the re-slicing the pie? So for the transit side, it's absolutely new money. It was it was money we anticipated getting, but again, you, we couldn't we didn't know the actual values until the awards were put out on this um, statewide project, the Springfield project. Uh, the state has their own budgets, um, so they've allocated additional funding for this project. I can't say exactly where that money is coming from, if they pulled it from another pool or if it's, you know, just additional uh, money from the federal authorization. Um, so I'm not, I, I can't necessarily clarify. We, I will look into that and have a clarification at the MPO meeting. So at, at, at this point, we're not amending the tip to take money from any other project. Correct, correct. That is absolutely okay. correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then uh, any other questions? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Andy? Okay, Agawam. Yes. Chickabee. Yes. East Hampton. Yes. Hadley. Yes. Holyoke. Yes. Longmeadow. Yes. 
Mass Bike, Gary. Yes. District one. Yes. District two. Yes. Carmen Stavros. Yes. Munson. Yes. Uh, pedestrian rep. Yes. Uh, PVTA. Yes. West Springfield. Yes. Williamsburg. Yes. Worthington. Yes. Okay, Mr. Chairman. I will declare it passed. And let's move on to the next item. Uh, Gary, I think this is just for information. Correct. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of slides on uh, our status of the update to the regional transportation plan. So looking at uh, the schedule here, you can see we're, we're, um, we've completed the first two pieces uh, of our outreach, including our focus groups. We, we uh, met with our um, commissioners uh, last week at the PVPC and got some similar outreach that the other focus groups had. And now we're in the process of developing uh, all of that information, summarizing it, getting a sense of uh, how we can use that content to adjust the vision and goals of the draft plan. Uh, we'll proceed to develop these draft chapters and we anticipate having a website link up and live for the RTP and all the current products prior to the next uh, January JTC meeting. We will continue to develop chapters and make you aware of those and have uh, content available for review prior to the actual draft being released in June. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, Andy. So this is a just a summary of the poll that we had at every focus group, except the transit focus group on uh, the current allocation of discretionary funding for the financial component of the long range plan. And with the exception of roadway maintenance, the uh, recommendation was either that the current level of funding for the various categories was either too low or about right. The only uh, category where the focus group thought we might have the percentage too high was for roadway maintenance, where 40% of the respondents felt that might be a little too high for this uh, uh, for the identification of future projects and the categories that we should be concentrating on. So we'll, uh, once we have the complete financial information available, we'll bring this back to the JTC and we'll have this conversation. Uh, this is what we've done for the last two updates of the RTP. And we've used the JTC as the formal body to, to have this discussion and what makes sense. Andy, we'll go to the next slide. Here's the chapters that uh, we anticipate developing as part of this plan. And really, we expect to have uh, chapter one and chapter two available in draft form sometime in January. Uh, the next two chapters are actually some of the last chapters that would be completed. Uh, the public participation process is something that we normally hold until the end and we summarize all the comments that we receive in the document, the equity chapter. Uh, a lot of the presentation Jeff McCullough just gave you on the components of our Title VI and environmental justice and now Justice 40 requirements go into that chapter. So we won't likely have that available until uh, closer to the full development of the draft, probably April or May. The chapters that will likely be releasing February through March and April, are these next existing conditions chapters where we give a profile of the regional assets and then topics like safety, security, congestion, uh, livability, climate change. We'll also be expecting uh, system performance chapters. So our performance measures, our future forecasts would be the projections out to the 2050 analysis year for population and housing and employment the needs, strategies, and projects that uh, were part of the focus group. Those items are likely to be a later piece that we developed. And then finally, our conformity chapters on financial component, air quality, environmental consultation, all of those take a little bit longer and we'll likely have those closer to an April, May 
type of a time frame as we get all of the information we need from our partners from both MassDOT and, and other uh, state agencies. Um, I believe that's all I have. If there's any questions, happy to answer those. Are there any questions at this stage? Hmm? Not seeing any, so thank you. And I guess you're up for number seven, too. Thank you. Every four years, the Pioneer Valley Metropolitan Planning Organization's planning process is certified by Federal Highway and Federal Transit. We have received our date for this certification review. It's actually started. Uh, Federal Highway and Federal Transit have requested a lot of information on um, current reports and, and processes that we've been conducting. We uh, have made that available. We expect to have uh, additional questions that are asked of us over the next couple of weeks. But what this all means is based on the desk review that the feds complete of our MPO process, we will have a formal in-person slash hybrid review that's currently scheduled for Wednesday, February 1st. We don't know what that agenda will be like, but once we have one, we'll, we'll make it available. We'll uh, um, provide you know additional information. There is a required public uh, meeting component of this as well, and uh, that's expected to potentially be after the February MPO meeting. But again, that's tentative. And once we have additional information. Uh, so we just we want to continue to provide updates on this process. Our federal partners have already provided an update to the MPO. And we're just going to continue to give you a status report on where this stands. And uh, once uh, the review is done and a report has been issued, we can uh, talk about the findings that came up. Uh, as a result of this process. So happy to answer any questions on that. And I don't see any hands. So thank you for that. And let's move on to number eight. The last one is on the regional performance measures. Let's go to the first slide, Andy. Um, performance measures began a few years ago as part of the MAP 21 legislation, and they've been continued in the FAST Act and the current uh, BIL, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. It requires that states and MPOs develop performance targets in three categories. So PM1 are safety measures, PM2 are the pavement and bridge performance measures, and then PM3 are system performance measures, which uh, I'll define what that is uh, in a few in a slide, a couple down. Uh, we set the, the safety targets annually. We last set those in January of this year. And the, the PM2 and PM3 targets are set every two to four years. There, there's a two and there's a four year target developed. Well, those were last set in 2020. Uh, we have, as an MPO, chosen to adopt the state targets. And the rationale behind that is if you develop your own regional targets, there is a higher expectation of perform, uh, reporting. And uh, in adopting the state targets, we're still advocating uh, the reduction and improvement in the areas as defined under these measures, but we don't have the requirement to report. MassDOT takes care of the reporting. So as an MPO, we've chosen uh, to continue to adopt the state targets. Those then appear into our certification documents. So the regional transportation plan, the TIP, the work program, uh, we include the latest targets in, in all of those documents. Next slide. So the safety performance measures are based on uh, the total number of fatalities, the rate of the fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, the total number of serious injuries, the rate of those serious injuries per 100 vehicle miles traveled, and then the total combined non-motorized injuries and fatalities. We've received our information on these updated targets for the 2023 year from MassDOT, and we'll have a presentation on that for you at your January JTC meeting on 
how those have changed over the last year or two. Next slide. The uh, PM2 measures for pavement and bridge. Uh, we received this information through MassDOT and you have the following uh, six areas in it's the percentage of pavement in good condition on the interstate system, the percentage of pavement in poor condition on the interstate, uh, the same two factors except on the non-interstate national highway system, and then the percentage of national highway system bridges that are in good and poor condition. Uh, again, we, we get this information uh, largely through MassDOT and uh, we uh, will we'll have new targets. We haven't received that information yet, but we have a schedule and a couple of slides that, that will show you when we expect to have this in front of you. Next slide. And finally, our uh, PM3 measures on system reliability. Those are the travel time reliability for the interstate and uh, national highway system, and the same for the truck travel time reliability. We also have the percent, this is new for our area. Um, we are now required to present on the percentage of non-single occupancy vehicle travel and the peak hour of excessive delay. And then something we've been doing over time as well is the uh, reduction in mobile source emissions as a result of projects that are funded through the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality CMAC program. And this is, I believe, our last slide. So this is the schedule. Um, we're giving you the information now that we, we have to do these uh, required updates through the MPO. The expectation is we'll receive all of this information from MassDOT uh, over the next month or so. And we will bring that to the JTC and the MPO as it's available. So we will definitely have the safety information uh, for you at your uh, January meeting. We potentially may have the bridge pavement and system reliability information as well. Uh, those must be adopted by the MPO by no later than the end of February of this year. That puts them on track to be included in our current tip and will be included in the uh, long range plan as well. So happy to answer any questions on performance measures, but you'll be hearing about these over the next couple of months as well. Okay, are there any questions for Gary on this? I, I do have one. Uh, I just wondered, do, do all of the Massachusetts MPOs adopt the state criteria? I, I it, initially they all did, I, I am not, um, clear if that's still the trend. Uh, I hate to put them on the spot, but I know Chris Clem is here from MassDOT, Office of Transportation Planning. Chris, do you know the answer to that? Hey, good morning, Gary. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, other MPOs tend to adopt the statewide uh, targets as well for the reasons that you shared just a minute ago. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I guess we can move on to the next item. Back to Andy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here for one moment. Okay, so this is just for informational uh, purposes at this point in time. Um, each January, we kick off the development of our new transportation improvement program. Uh, and so here's our draft schedule. Uh, as of now, obviously, I'm calling it a draft. Uh, we'll have this finalized uh, by the January JTC meeting. We just want to get it out there early to make sure uh, if there's any uh, issues, we can have those addressed now. Um, this is based off the schedule that MassDOT provided us um, earlier this week. Um, basically, what we'll do is at the January 11th JTC meeting, we'll start uh, our discussions on, uh, you know, our project universe and uh, getting the TEC information out to the project proponents uh, for them to update. Uh, around that same time, January 12th, we have it uh, listed here. We'll be uh, informing uh, chief elected officials and the PVPC commissioners 
that this process is starting for the 24 to 28 uh, transportation improvement program. On January 24th, we'll in introduce the updated list of projects we're calling Project Universe uh, to the MPO. At this point in time, what we'll be looking for is just to ensure that we have all projects listed. Uh, the information, the cost, the scoring, the design status, uh, the, the support information will not be updated yet. We're just ensuring that we have all projects that we're going to be review uh, over the next couple months uh, listed there. Uh, in January, uh, we're, we're expected to receive the financial information for the transportation improvement program. February 7th and 8th is what's called MassDOT tip days. This is where PVPC will sit down virtually, most likely with MassDOT the, and all the subsections, design, bridge, right of way, environmental, uh, and review our project universe, specifically those projects uh, that are currently programmed and any projects that we feel would be ready for uh, be for the tip over the next several years. We'll get feedback from tip days that we'll then utilize on February 9th, which is the second Thursday of the month. We're avoiding the second Wednesday of the month because of tip days. We want to make sure that MassDOT is available to attend our uh, tip subcommittee meeting. So we're moving it to the second Thursday of the month. This will not be the full JTC meeting. This will be our tip subcommittee where each project proponent will sign up uh, for a specific time to sit down with MassDOT, with Office of Transportation Planning and PVPC and discuss and review any changes to the projects and update the score of those projects. Uh, so please put that date on your calendars we'll send out additional information as we get closer to the date. In February it is anticipated that MassDOT will have a project review committee meeting. So if you're in the process of kicking off a new TIP project, uh, that is the deadline or that February will most likely be the deadline. Uh, early February will most likely be the deadline for having those projects uh, updated in uh, the MapIt software. <clears throat> the third Wednesday of February is is when we'll hold our full JTC meeting. Uh, the goal for this meeting is to have the updated project ranking. So you'll see in, in January, you'll receive the project universe that we'll review. In February, we should have updated costs, updated design, updated scores ready. And this is the tool we'll use to start advancing a uh, list of priority projects that the MPO will use to uh, make a decision on which projects to actually get funded in the TIP. Uh, what's our next date? So the 15th. Uh, and Gary, we do we have this date set yet, or is this is this not accurate? The February 15th for the um, Federal Highway Administration uh, public meeting. That's that's tentative. Yet. That is yeah, okay. tentative. It, okay. it would either be. <clears throat> that day or the February 28th MPO meeting, but we haven't gotten confirmation from Federal Highway yet. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that highlighted obviously. So it's either gonna be the 15th or the 28th for the uh, the public uh, meeting that Gary re referenced earlier. Uh, again, February 28th MPO, they'll review that list that the JTC uh, reviewed on the 15th at the March 8th meeting. The JTC will take any feedback from the MPO. And again, we'll, that's when we'll start looking at creating um, kind of a pre-draft draft of the, the TIP um, at the 28th, uh, March 28th MPO meeting. Again, the, the MPO will have a, a, another time to review. And really at that point, they'll be looking to make uh, what we're calling a preferred list. Uh, which in April will ultimately uh, become a draft that the JTC will, will review. At that time, we'll be looking for a recommendation from the JTC uh, to the MPO to release the draft tip uh, for 
public review. At the same time, uh, the JTC will be asked to release the draft UPWP, uh, which again, at some of these previous meetings, uh, we will give you updates on that as well. Jumping into April, uh, the, the, the MPO will uh, release, hopefully release the recommended draft uh, for public review. You'll see for uh, late April and early May, the tip will be out for public review. The UPWP will also be out for public review. Uh, the May 10th JTC meeting will be a formal public uh, meeting for uh, uh, commenting on the, the TIP. And then all comments will be compiled. Any updated information will be compiled uh, and brought back to the MPO for their, their endorsement on May 23rd. So we'll be looking for another recommendation at the May 10th JTC meeting uh, that the, the MPO endorse both the TIP and U, UPWP based on our uh, discussions at that time. Uh, and that is uh, when we hope to have the, the TIPs and UPWP finalized. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll give it back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments to that presentation? Um, I'll toss in my two cents. I wonder if, have you sent this out to all of us? Nope, we'll, okay. uh, we'll get this out. Um, actually, we'll get this out right after the meeting. Okay, yeah, I think that would be uh, useful so we can put in, put what we are doing in context. Yep, absolutely. And, um, okay, that that's fine. Uh, is there any other business before? Seeing none, uh, I would, Oh, yes, I do have, uh, I see a hand. Uh, I have a it. question. Um, I heard that there's, uh, MassDOT is requiring a new uh, requirement related to a number of projects, including the X, to do a, a full environment, have the project have to do a full environmental re, um, review, pro, you know, a, a full environmental review, which is um, not something that's already um, budgeted into the project and causing, you know, um, potentially gonna cause considerable delay. So wanna find out whether this, from the maybe the MassDOT folks, whether is, is, this is this for real and why? And how are they, do they realize the full impact on the local communities? Well, I see that both uh, Jeffrey and Gary have their hands up to reply. Uh, who, either one. Yeah, let me start and Jeff can jump in, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA for short, is what I believe Betsy is referring to. And there's a new regulation in Massachusetts that enhances uh, environmental justice outreach. Uh, for any project that has to go through this MEPA process. So what's happened is that projects like the X are triggering this requirement. And because the project is within a certain radius of an environmental justice population, it, it's required to do a uh, environmental impact report that it may not have triggered in the past. And, and we are aware of that. Uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has been involved with the committee with MEPA that, that's been talking about the current regulations and the potential impacts on these. And, and that also, if you remember, uh, Betsy, we had changed our TEC earlier this year to address scoring as part of the environmental review process to, to give points for projects that uh, as they go through this, this stages of the process, because we recognize this is going to add time. Unfortunately, not every project was grandfathered and it does add a burden uh, in terms of time. Well, my response is, and I know uh, our DPW director is 
you know, basically putting in a formal uh, protest. I mean, this is this is um, just, um, you know, at this point in the process, um, and it really is. It's supposed to quote help environmental justice communities, but it's now penalizing environmental justice communities um, by forcing. In other words, it it just does not make sense. So I would hope that the at some level there may be you know the uh, commission or the MPO brings us up and issues a formal protest uh, to. Or and or at least recognition to what they're doing, because um, this is you know this means the Britain X is the X project is not going to stay on schedule, and basically, essentially, almost can't happen now. We we had similar concerns, and we uh, we made sure that you know we we had shared those concerns with with MEPA, PV. PC did send a comment letter to MEPA uh, on some of these changes and, and the potential impacts that it might have. And it's something that, um, you know, we, we have been involved with and will continue to be involved with. But it's not getting a resolution. I don't believe we have the, the way the law is written, and I'm no expert in this area, but the way the law was written, um, it really just had to go through the comment period and, and it it had to happen this way. And if changes are going to happen, it it would likely happen as a result of additional changes to the MEPA regulations, which are not likely to occur until the new administration is in place. And then so at some point, maybe at the next meeting, there could be a presentation of the uh, all of the projects that are being impacted but with this? Is it only the X or is it? We'll uh, know, Betsy, after our tip days meeting there, that's going to be the, that's when we'll get all that information. So our February JTC meeting, we could give an update on that, yes. Okay. Well, rec you know, other communities have got to realize that this is out there now because um, it's, uh, you know, a, a, a significant impact. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments under other business? Before I call for a motion to adjourn, Andy, would you be able, and maybe other staff be able to just hang on <clears throat> for a couple of minutes? I just had a couple of administrative things I wanted to go over with you. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, then could I ask for a motion to adjourn? I'm in. Uh, and a second? Second. And does anybody oppose adjourning at this time? Seeing none, uh, I will uh, declare that the meeting has been adjourned and I'll just talk with staff for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye. Oh, gee, making people log themselves out of the meeting. So, <laughs> um, so I, I just had a question. I, I, with this agenda of things coming up,